Galatians 6, let's read together. If you will follow along, we'll begin at verse 1. Scripture says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. This is the word of the Lord. I want to speak today on the theme of an army of restoration. And you did read that correctly, an army of restoration. Not an army of devastation, but one of restoration. Paul teaches in this passage what the church of God should be known for in its regular rhythm and life. Now, the sad thing is, I have heard the very opposite about Christians and the church in my lifetime. I have heard this statement countless times. The church is the only army that shoots their own soldiers and then leaves them alone on the field of battle to die. Again, I have heard it said far too many times, the church is the only army that shoots their own soldiers and then leaves them alone on the field of battle to die. Now, that is simply ridiculous. You say, no, it's not. I've been there. I've lived through it. Well, I want to challenge maybe your experience a little bit today. First off, I want to say that the idea that the church is the only army that does this is preposterous. Have you ever been in big business in corporate America before? What about the world of politics? We live in a dog-eat-dog world. Survival of the fittest. The early bird gets the worm. First off, the church is not the only army that does this. Nonetheless, I want to challenge this statement in a second way, and that is to say that that is probably not the real church, as in the church, capital C, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would treat each other in that manner. Listen, we expect the world to shoot its wounded, but not even the world expects the church to shoot its own wounded. Many professing Christians in this world have made the church a slaughterhouse where the saints butcher the fallen and the faltering and the broken. Instead of it being the hospital for sinners that God has called the family of Christ to be. Now here's the point I'm trying to make. There's a lot of religious people that call themselves the church. And they very much resemble a people in the Bible. They resemble the religious leaders in John chapter 8 who took the woman caught in the act of adultery and in the middle of Jesus' teaching threw her down at his feet in humiliation and embarrassment. They represent the older brother who was furious that that younger prodigal son had showed back up to the house and that the father would welcome him with open arms and throw him a meal. They represent the religious leaders of John chapter 9, who when the blind man was healed and giving praise to Jesus and didn't go with their religious flow, they cast him out of the synagogue. My point here, friends, is that it is possible to be a certain type of religious army, but not to be the true Christian church. Chuck Swindoll has made this statement, our God is a master at turning devastation into restoration. I think that's an absolutely wonderful statement we should embrace as part of our identity as Christians. God takes devastation, restores it. The church is supposed to be an army of restoration. God specializes in using wounded people and restoring them. 
Think in the Bible of a man like Joseph, wounded Joseph, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, forgotten in prison, lied about, slandered, and yet God takes a wounded, broken man and restores him and uses him to save that family that betrayed him, save the nation of Egypt, and even really save the world from famine. Think about a wounded Moses, murder, loses his parents, 40 years in the desert, and yet God restores this man and uses him to defeat the world's superpower and free the people of God. Think with me about a wounded man named Samson, a man who made devastation of his life with sexual sin, pride, arrogance, not relying on the Lord, yet God chose to restore Samson at the end to throw down the Philistine leaders and rulers. Or, even more so as Christians, we have a wounded Savior, do we not, brothers and sisters? A wounded Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who defeated the very gates of hell. It was by his wounds that we are healed. So if you're wounded today, I want you to understand the Christian faith is all about turning devastation into restoration. And he has called to the church to be an agent of this restoration. So as we look at these next verses, may the Lord burn in our hearts the heart of God in this way. Again, Galatians 6.1, if a man is overtaken, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, he had talked in the previous chapter about the fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Now, Paul is going to show us what someone who really walks in the Spirit looks like day to day in their life. Notice verse 1 begins with the word, brethren. This word shows us how we should treat one another. We are a family. The church is a body, but it is also a family. It is an army, but it is also a family. Now, the fact that we are brothers and sisters does not keep us out of sin, but it does dictate the way we treat one another when we fall into sin. Can I say that again? The fact that we are brothers and sisters does not mean we don't get into trouble. We don't get into sin, but it does change the way we treat one another when we fall into sin. And that's exactly the heart of this text. If a man is overtaken, or the NIV translates this, caught in any sin, the idea here is a sudden temptation, a sudden passion excites in the depths of your being. You are surprised by sin without warning. Sin invades you. It overtakes you. A temptation strikes you. The devil comes at you. You are seduced. Something has happened against your better judgment. That is what is going on here in this text. Now, if a man is overtaken or caught, this idea here is like King David in the Old Testament, and he's walking out on his porch, and all of a sudden, he looks the wrong direction, and he sees Bathsheba on the roof. And his passion inflames him, overtakes him in that moment. It is like Peter, overtaken by fear and dread, and being outnumbered, and denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times. Friends, a worn down, weary saint, flies off the handle, loses their testimony with bad language, rude behavior, open mouth, insert foot. Brothers, sisters, this happens to all of us. It does not say that this is the exception of the church. In fact, I would say to you, this is the daily life of the church. How do we fall into these kinds of pitfalls? Well, sometimes we listen to our own heart and not the Holy Spirit. Rather than walking in the Spirit, we, we follow our hearts. The world says, just follow your heart. Do what makes you feel good. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
Sometimes through the temptations of Satan, who goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, he puts just the right thing, the right image on your screen, just the right person in your way, just the right object to make you begin to covet inside of you that leads you astray. Maybe by the evil example of others. What does Psalm 1 say? Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the the path of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. Yet you see someone else doing very good, doing the very wrong thing, and that leads you to say, you know what? Just maybe I'll give it a try. Just maybe no one's watching. It's just me and that person. And you give in to that temptation. I would suggest to you that in the context of Galatians, this is also referring to someone overtaken by false doctrine. Remember, the Galatians were in a spiritual war over the right view of the gospel. They were letting the wrong voices speak into their hearts. The wrong people were teaching them, catechizing them, influencing them. Too many of us today, we are more influenced by Fox News and CNN whatever other channel you watch, than we are by the word of God and godly elders and pastors. Too many of us are more influenced in God's church by televangelists who have a very popular and appealing message, but not necessarily the message of the word of the Lord. And so we start to build into the depths of our souls these views about God that are just not right. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a moment of being overtaken by trespass. Trespassing means you went somewhere you were not supposed to go. That's sin. All of a sudden, you find yourself tripping and falling and hurting. Maybe the works of the flesh that we read in chapter 5 a few sermons back. And now, these things have overtaken you. I like what the Puritan writer William Perkins has said here. He said, As we are careful for our bodies to avoid downfall, so we ought to be careful, nay, a thousand times more careful for our souls. Isn't that true? If we are careful not to trip with our bodies, how much more should we watch over our souls that we don't find ourselves in this kind of a position? Well, what does Paul say? You who are spiritual, restore them. You who are spiritual. Now, of course, that means the elitist Christians. That's the elders of the church and the deacons of the church, the small group, the Bible study leaders. Those are the ones who are responsible for all the work of restoration. That's what it says, right? Actually, no, it does not say that. It simply says, you who are spiritual. I think when we read this text and we start to think, oh, that's the elders, that's the deacons, that's the Bible study leaders, and we look around at the condition of the church and we see that 99% of the church has went AWOL on this command, that's why we have such a problem in the church. We have forsaken our post. We have given up our calling. We have left the daily rhythm that God desires for his people. I'm going to tell you about an unusual figure in the history of the church, a man by the name of Simeon the Stylite. Well, he is often considered the first of what is known as the Desert Fathers of the early church. He lived in the 5th century, around the year 423. He felt he needed to get closer to God and be more spiritual. And so, Simeon the Stylite went and built a pillar on the edge of the Syrian desert. He climbed to the top of it. And according to church history, he lived on the top of this pillar for the next six years. As you can imagine, this was a very odd sight. And many people came to see Simeon perched here in the desert. And they came to see either if this hermit had lost his mind or maybe in the solitude and freedom from worldly distractions, he had really grown closer to God and had greater wisdom for them. Living on the top of this pole made many people think he was spiritual. So I ask you, is this what it means to be spiritual? Well, I sure wonder 
if Uber delivered his dinners out there on top of the pole. And I wonder what he did when he had to go to the bathroom. One writer asked, if this is spirituality, is there child care on top of the pole in the desert? I think the point is, you don't have to go and live alone in the desert to be spiritual. This is not what Paul's referring to. This is actually somewhat outlandish, in my opinion. So what does it mean to be spiritual? Well, we have, in the context of this, in the last few sermons, talked about what it means to be born again, to be given a new heart by the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what this means. Like Paul said in Galatians 5, the one who walks in the Spirit won't desire the flesh. They won't gratify them. Uh, Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you get saved, you become spiritual. Why? Not because you go to the desert somewhere and you build a pole and you hide out in the desert from the world. You become spiritual because God the Holy Spirit resides inside you. And when you are filled with the Spirit, what this simply means is you are less controlling yourself and God the Holy Spirit is more controlling you. This isn't getting more of the Holy Spirit. You get all of the Holy Spirit when you're saved. He comes in you. He baptizes you. He regenerates you. But now, He is controlling you. And now... Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit starts to show up. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. See, this is not an elite class of Christians. So if you're saved and the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you have a God-given responsibility to be an agent of restoration in the family of God. So... You who are spiritual, restore them. Now, it's interesting. This word restore here, the same word that was used in Mark chapter 1, when you see the apostles out mending their nets after fishing. They had been damaged. They were mending them. They were restoring them back to their proper function so they could be used properly to go fishing the next day. The word in the Greek language was often used in the first century to refer to a doctor who had to set a dislocated joint or even a broken bone. They were restoring that person's wound or injury. Now here's what I want to point out to you. Too often the Christian army, the self-professed church, has not restored one who has been overcome by trespass and sin. Instead... Number one, they have ignored them. They have ignored them. In other words, what they've done is pretended like, I didn't see what happened. I'm just going to look the other way. Let's pretend like they don't exist. And maybe they'll get it all worked out. But I just don't want to deal with that. They're like a timid medical student who sees a patient with a terrible wound, but is afraid to touch it, afraid to deal with it. And so that person's wound is never healed. Some of us in this room know what it's like to be treated like you have the plague because your life is caught up in sin. That is not what the church is supposed to do. We are not supposed to treat people like they have the plague and ignore them. We are supposed to restore them. Other times, we stand around and we talk about what bad shape that sinner is in. Boy, that bone is sticking out of the skin. How gross that is. Wow, would you take a look at that? They had a bad fall. I'm sure glad I don't have a fracture like that. You know, we do this thing, this kind of treatment called gossip. We ignore them. We gossip about them. We don't restore them. Another thing some churches do is rather than restore them, they destroy them. So, what happens is, all of a sudden, we start to get angry that they would even show up in the spiritual emergency room in the first place. We blame them. We condemn them. We throw them out on the street, never actually addressing the wound or the break and giving them a chance to heal. Friends, the church is not a museum for perfectly curated saints. 
It is not a country club where everyone comes together and looks like they have it all perfectly worked out. The body of Christ is a loving family that does serve to do triage and medical, spiritual care for their brothers and sisters. Sinners come together and confess their unworthiness and God's great worth. Together we praise his name. Together we take his meal for sustenance. Together we sit under the preached word of God and we let his word heal our hearts. Together we restore each other. And listen, that's the only way the army is ever strong enough to go out and rebuild the broken world. You see, that's the next step. The church is a hospital But it doesn't stop there. It's a hospital that brings healing here so we can go out into a broken world and fix it by the power of Christ. And so if we're not doing restoring here, we'll never rebuild out there. Let me say it again. If we are not restoring here in the church, we'll never see the world rebuilt the way it's supposed to be. When Christians are caught in sin, they do not need isolation or amputation. They need restoration. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, aim for restoration. That's the bullseye. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. Your aim when you see another brother or sister in the family hurting is not to ignore them. It is not to gossip about them. It is not to destroy them. I'm going to add one more. It's not to excuse them. You know, I've noticed in the church today, we're really good at talking and making excuses. So we'll say, well, you know, in this day and age, it may have been a sin back then, but we need to just tread lightly. We shouldn't call sin, sin, darkness, darkness, light, light, because you know we live in a modern era. Let me tell you something. Imagine going to a doctor and they see the serious sickness that is spreading in the patient's life. And they say, well, you know, everyone gets cancer nowadays. So we just, we're just going to kind of say, it's not really that big of a deal. We're just going to say, just keep doing what you're doing. It's all going to work out. Everyone else is doing it anyhow. We're going to be a affirming community, a welcoming community. We're going to say that God takes you just the way you are. I know some churches have well intentionally said that. That is the gospel of hell. The gospel of hell says, oh, God will take you just as you are. Nothing has to change with a smile. Just go right ahead and keep on doing what you're doing. God loves us all. Well, brothers and sisters, the true love of God is so great that it brings conviction that it overcomes our sin. It doesn't leave us as we are. It causes restoration. It doesn't leave the net broken. Instead, it brings mending to the net so the net can now function the way it was originally intended to do, to catch fish. You see, restoration from God is like James 5. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, notice they were wandering away, they don't stay the same. True restoration means they are brought back the way God made them, in his image and likeness, living for his glory. And if you do that, you bring back a sinner from their wandering and save their soul from death, and you cover a multitude of sins. That's beautiful. But how do we do it? We do it in a spirit of gentleness. Listen, there's a time for strong language, harsh language, powerful language. John Calvin once said, every good shepherd, every good elder, every good minister should have two voices, one for the sheep and one for the wolves. When he says a spirit of gentleness, he's talking about with the sheep. He's not talking about with the wolves. I want you to understand that. There's sometimes elders use a very different voice when they're dealing with wolves. You don't talk gently to a wolf. You drive it out. You don't talk gently to a demon. You cast it out. But when it's one of the sheep, one of the family, we need to not be harsh and judgmental and arrogant and angry. So this is the posture of a shepherd. 
Listen, you've all been before a doctor with crass, rude, bedside mannerisms. It's not very pleasant, is it? We here should read this and understand that the way we restore people matters to God. Listen, Moses was commanded to speak to the rock and water would flow out from it. Moses did not have the spirit of gentleness. Instead, he struck the rock. You say, well, you know what? Water still flowed out of it. You know why? Because God's merciful. But you know what else happened? Moses couldn't enter the promised land because of it. There are consequences we cause when we don't do things God's way. God's way is to treat each other with this kind of gentleness. Proverbs 15, some of you need to memorize this verse. You need to write it down today, right now. You need to put it on your car. You need to put it on your fridge. You need to read it every morning. It will change your life, this wisdom verse. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh, grievous, strong words stir up more anger. That'll fix a lot of marriages. That'll fix a lot of parenting relationships. That'll fix a lot of work relationships. When we treat each other this way, gentleness, gentleness. By the way, gentleness, kindness, they are not the same thing as weakness. All right? God calls us to be kind and gentle. It's not the same thing as being weak. All right? It is strength under control. It is how a wife is called to be in 1 Peter 3, 4. Notice it talks about a wife's heart being the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. It's a powerful way to win people to have this kind of a heart. By the way, it's also a very masculine trait to be gentle. We are told in Proverbs 25, with patience a ruler may be persuaded. Listen to this, and a soft tongue will break a bone. You get what the wisdom writer is saying? There's more power in a soft tongue than acting a fool with your mouth. That's what he's saying. That's the modern English well known for translation. Why gentleness? This is not your chance to insult them, to use cruel language, to rub their faces in it, to humiliate them, to pretend you never knew them and ignore them. You should not cast them out to a cold and heartless world. The whole point of church discipline is restoration. And it starts one-on-one. That's where it starts. Matthew 18, go to the person. Go to them directly. Help them. Restore them with gentleness. You are not God. God has every right to come in wrath and judgment. You, my friend, are not God. So be merciful as your Father is merciful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 this way, ask this question. By the way, good parenting tip. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? Hey, kids, would you rather your parents come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? What would you prefer? Some of you need the rod. I look around. I know it. It's coming. Watch out. But it's better to receive it the first time in a spirit of gentleness, isn't it? Far better indeed. Now, he says here, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. That's very important. Just because we're a part of the work of God in restoration, you need to be reminded of something. Even spiritual people can stumble. Sometimes the most severe people in the church are the ones who forget their own weaknesses. They forget they also have a past. Or as Jesus said, they forget that they have a log in their own eye, and they're worrying about everyone's speck in their brother's eyes. Check your own heart before you start looking at somebody else's. I love what one friend who's a counselor said. He asked this question. It's worth writing down if you're taking notes. I try to live by this. Are you a wounded healer or an unhealed wounder? If you don't transform your pain, you will certainly transmit your pain. Let me say it again. That's good, isn't it? Are you a wounded healer or an unhealed wounder? If you don't transform your pain, you will certainly transmit your pain. How many of us are unhealed wounders? 
instead of wounded healers. God's called us to be wounded healers. God has, we've been wounded, and God now uses us in the work of bringing healing to others. Notice what Paul says next here. He says in verse 2, Bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Selfishness says, I have enough problems on my own. The modern church files into a sanctuary, single file, very individualistic, caters to my needs, files out single file. The New Testament says, one another, one another, family, body, house, dwelling place of God, sheep in a fold, branches in the vine, unity, one another, not isolationists. We should not celebrate the sins that bear down others. We should not overlook the sins that push down others. We are called to be agents of relief, to bear one another's burdens. Now, this is very important. We are not called to taunt them, insult them, rejoice in their failure. We are called to assist them. By the way, the Greek word here for bearing their burdens is the very same word that's used for Jesus bearing the cross. He became sin who knew no sin. He took up the cross, right? He bore the cross. He took our shame and our sin on himself. With joy, he bore the cross. He took the shame. He did not despise it. How do we do this? We comfort them. We sympathize with them in their sorrow. We pray to God for them. We support them. Warm hugs and kind words of sympathy. Whether it's practical ways like cleaning a house or bringing a meal or sharing an appropriate book or time together. Or how about you just call them on the stinking phone and talk to them and let them know you haven't forgotten them. This is a simple command to obey. We can do this. We first cast all of our burdens upon the Lord. He sustains us, so now we can help. God uses us in the work of his bearing the burdens of his people. The Geneva Bible translators say that Paul touches on the problem here. We are commonly the most severe judges who forget our own weaknesses. Remember, once you needed someone else to help you. And now you are called to help others. Instead of the law being a burden upon others... We should be lifting up their burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. Let me ask you, who in the body of Christ have you bore their burden lately? Prayed with them, visited them, talked with them. Now, what I'm not saying is how many of you are still waiting for a phone call from elders and deacons? I'm asking how many of you have bore one another's burdens? Those of you who are spiritual have the Holy Spirit inside of you have shown kindness and compassion and care. And how many of you have ignored and gossiped and destroyed? That'll tell you real quick where your heart is, won't it? Well, we got to wrap this up. Look at verses 3 through 5, lightning fast. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one should bear his own load. There is a story, it's probably an apocryphal story, meaning it probably didn't happen, but it's a very famous story. Maybe it did. It's about the great boxer Muhammad Ali. It is said that Muhammad Ali once got on an airplane flying to one of his fights, and a stewardess on the airplane came up to this great boxing champion, and she said to him, Sir, you need to prepare for takeoff. And Muhammad Ali responded to the stewardess, objecting, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she replied to him, Superman don't need no airplane. Well, Paul is reminding us of this very thing here, isn't he? 
If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The best of men are men at best. Listen to me. This work of restoration is not to be done in your own strength. You are a man. You are a woman. You are not free from sin. You are just as liable to fall. You are not God. Your heart is also deceitful and desperately wicked. Your works of righteousness are like filthy rags. We believe in this church, the Bible teaches the doctrine of radical depravity, total depravity. We are dead in our sins. We have nothing good to offer God on our own. Stop thinking so highly of yourself. Remember, we are all beggars. And Christ is the bread of life. Remember what you once were. Don't think so highly of yourself. Instead, examine your own works. Check your own heart. If we are not bringing about restoration, maybe it's because something's not restored inside of us. Something's not right inside of us. Stop comparing yourself with others. Others are not the standard. Look to Christ and his example. He is the standard. Can you say with Paul, I have lived in good conscience before God until this day? Can you say with Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is my strength? You will only be good to others if you're right in yourself. Check your heart, brothers and sisters. If there's no restoration going on, maybe we need the restoration. Maybe it's here before it gets outside of me. We want to talk about changing the world. Well, we got to start here, right? We got to be fixed here, restored here, before we repair outside of us. Now, verse 5, as we close, seems like a contradiction. Um, It seems very confusing in the English language, because verse 2 told us to bear one another's burdens. And now verse 5 says something that seems the very opposite, to carry our own load. What in the world is going on? Bear one another's burdens, carry your own load. Well, the answer is that in the original language of Greek that the, Bible, the New Testament was written in. These are two different Greek words. So in verse 2, the Greek word there describes a weight that must be shared because it's too heavy for any one person to carry. It's too heavy. But here in verse 5, the Greek word refers to a man's traveling pack, almost like a backpack. Carry your own load. In other words... This is reminding us that on the day of judgment, it's not going to be about what your neighbor did. It's not going to be about how you were treated. It's going to be about what you did. Was your heart right? Were you an agent of restoration? Were you faithfully following after Christ? By the way, as we close, this last thing I want to call you to, the word used in verse 5, load, Same word Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 11. Listen to me. This is how the Christian life works. We cast all of our burdens upon the Lord. We cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Jesus took our burdens on the cross. We were crippled beneath our sin. The weight of our sin. Our trespasses. We could never move one inch toward God on our own. And Jesus came and lived the perfect life we could never live. And on the cross, he suffered the very wrath of God, the judgment of God, the condemnation of God for his people. He became sin who knew no sin for us. And so, he takes our burdens, we get this blessing. He takes our sin, we get his righteousness. And then our lives change. And then we can start to help others. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 11. In fact, our small groups, if you're coming to them, our grow groups right now, have been studying this in depth, the heart of Jesus. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, this is what Jesus says, very famous words. Come unto me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, weak and burdened. Listen, I will give you rest. But listen to what he says next. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For 
my yoke is easy. And here's where I was getting at. The next word he's about to use is the word used here in verse 5. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, what Jesus gives you, it's light. Why is it light? Because Jesus is with you. Because the Holy Spirit is filling you. Because God has forgiven you. Because he will empower you to carry this. To take up the cross. To put sin to death. And to bring restoration to those hurting souls around you. May we be an army of restoration. It is only when we bring restoration that we can go out into the world and repair. So let us bow before the Lord in prayer. Mm -hmm.